guys, welcome back to my channel. It's me and your buddy Holan. Friends, today we are going to take the social science and we are starting a new chapter that is Medieval India Society Resource and Trade. In this chapter, we will be studying the continuation part of the last chapter, the Medieval India, the Centers of Power. So in this class, we will be studying about Medieval India in detail. So let's move on to this chapter. At the beginning, we have a description from Baba Nama. And that is written about the Baba. And here we have a description in it. Let's read it. Hindustan is a wonderful land. Compared to the other countries, it is entirely different. The mountains, rivers, forests and deserts here are unique. The animals, plants, people, languages, rain and wind are all givers. Here it talks about the Hindustan or India. And there are some diverse things that is present in India like rivers, mountains, ranges, etc. So, it is talking about the diversity of India on the medieval time. There was not that much pollution and that was a good and nice sight and view. And that was the diversity of India in this description. Next, let's move on to this agriculture and artisanship. Here, uh, by looking on agriculture, we have a description by Alberoni, a Central Asian traveler. And he was a famous person, famous not person. And he had knew many languages like Arabic, Persian, Sanskrit, Greek, Hebrew, Syriac and Berber. Let's read his description. For farming cereals and grazing cattle, land revenue and grazing tax were to be paid to the rulers. Similarly, tax was to be paid on income from trade. One sixth of the income was to be spent for the protection of the country. Here it talks about the land revenue and grazing tax. As the main occupation of people in the medieval time was agriculture. And, to, uh, and for the people to farm cereals, they should give land revenue to the rulers. And then was grazing cattle. As the people has many domestic pet animals like cows, sheep, etc. And to graze them, they should pay the grazing tax. And uh, similarly, these taxes and revenues was given to the rulers in the form of income from their trade. And one-sixth of this income was spent for the protection of the country. Next, uh, the, we have studied that the chief occupation of people in medieval time was agriculture. And the major crops they grew was cotton, cereals, pulses, indigo, sugarcane, etc. And uh, there was a thing that the there was many cultivatable areas, many land that was very fertile to do cultivation and uh, agriculture. But they were all kept uncultivated. So, the rulers decided, decided to encourage this agriculture and brought a ownership right. And that was giving off the lands to the farmers. As uh, we have known that the, um, there was many uncultivated places. So those who first cultivated in these uncultivated areas, that particular area will be theirs. This was the ownership right that the rulers gave to the farmers. And next, uh, the rulers also added some uh, facilities for the farmers as it would be a great difficulty for them to manage a lot of things. So the, uh, the rulers arranged some facilities like arranged irrigation facilities, supplied seeds and granted tax relaxation. Uh, arranged irrigation facilities means arranged water supplication for the agricultural process. And next was supplied seeds. They supplied a good amount of seeds. And then was the granted tax relaxation. We have studied about the land revenue and grazing tax. So, uh, these taxes was less and given to the farmers by the rulers. They left these taxes. And uh, there was a system called Ikta and Jagdardari and that was giving the land as wages to the officers. 
In medieval time, the land was given as wages to the officers. And this system in Sultanate period was known as Ikta and in Mughal period as Jagiddari. Other than the agriculture, many other occupations also existed in the villages. They were metal work, pot making, weaving and other handicrafts. Weaving and other handicrafts were the important ones in the towns, were the important occupations in the towns. The uh, agriculture has a lot helped the textile industry or weaving because the cotton, indigo and silk is produced by agriculture. And the indigo is the kind of plant that is used for the color mixers to dye the clothes. The Indian weavers produced garments of different qualities and colors. The main ones among them were silk, cotton and wool. And in this time, they used color mixtures like indigo etc. And thus, many uh, new tools like spinning wheel and uh, looms were introduced in this time. And thus, Indian textile industry won the world acclaim. Now, we have studied about the agriculture and textile industry. Now, let's move on to the towns and trade. Here it is an uh, Italian traveller Niccolo Condi's description about the towns and trade. Let's read it. The great town Vijayanagara is situated near steep mountain ranges. There are attractive gardens and groves in this town. The markets of this prosperous town are full of costly goods. Here it talks about the Vijayanagara kingdom. We have studied about the Vijayanagara kingdom in the previous classes. And the Vijayanagara kingdom is situated or located near steep mountain ranges. And there were many attractive gardens and groves in these towns. And these towns in Vijayanagara kingdom was flooded and built with many diverse goods and costly goods. The agriculture was also favorable for the trade and commerce as the Indian spices, textile, leather, gems, sandals, metals, pearls, ivory, etc. were in a great demand for the foreign countries. And several traders from different countries came to India to engage in trade with India. And the people who came in the countries they came were Chinese, Arabs, Portuguese, Dutch, English and French. And friends, now there is a connection between Koral Kod and medieval time. Let's look what is it. Calico and Calicut Cotton textiles were exported from Calicut. These textiles were known as calico in the European market. Calico was called as calicut by the European. Here it is about the calico, the calicut. As the Europeans called calico as calicut. And the uh, and from calicut, these uh, textile things were exported to the other countries. And that was known as calico on that time. Now, we have a description by Ibn Battuta, a Moroccan traveller who reached India in the Sultanate period. Let's read his description and travelogue about the trade and commerce. The towns in India are highly populous and wealthy. The streets of the cities were flooded with diverse goods. Delhi and Dawlathabad are colourful cities. Here it is talking about the towns of India and they were made, filled and filled with many costly goods and diverse goods. And uh, he also added about Delhi and Dawlathabad and they were colourful cities. Now we have another description by Ralph Fitch, an English traveller who reached India in the Mughal period. Let's read his description. Agra, Fatehpur Sikri and Ahmedabad are bigger than London, the biggest city in the world. Delhi is a big and wealthy city. Here he is talking about Agra, Fatehpur Sikri and Ahmedabad. And he is thinking that the, uh, these cities Agra, Ahmedabad and Fatehpur Sikri are bigger than London, that the London is the biggest city in the world. And he also is talking about Delhi as the Delhi is a big and wealthy city. Now we are going to study a map showing the major trade centers in India. While we look on the map, we can see that these trade centers are situated near sea coast. 
and that is because the European travelers had to reach India and go back and that the only way was the water transportation. Let's study these uh, major trade centers one by one. Kochi, Kolkur and Kollam is at Kerala and Madurai, Tanjavur, Urayu, Mahabalipuram and Kanchipuram is at Tamil Nadu. Hampi is at Karnataka and Paitan at Maharashtra. Mushidabad and Kolkata is at West Bengal and Dhaka in Bangladesh. Ahmedabad and Surat is at Gujarat and Agra in Uttar Pradesh. These are the major trade centers in India. Now we are going to study about the workshops. Here is a French traveler, Werner, who reached India in Mukalpiri. Let's read his description. Big rooms where Karkhanas function are found in many places. Embroiders working under supervisor are found in one room, goldsmiths in another, dyers and cobblers work in different rooms. Here he is talking about Karkhanas. What are Karkhanas? The Karkhanas are the places are a big building containing many small rooms and in each room there will be a number of workers working. There will be in one room it may be cobblers and in other dyers etc. And these people are working for the Mughal kings and nobles. That is all about the workshops. Now let's move on to the social life of people. Here is a French traveler Tavernier's description about the social life. He reached India in the Mughal period. Let's read his description. The lifestyle, dressing and food habits are extensively varied across India. Extravagantly, colorfully dressed people and those sparsely clad were also found here. Here he is talking about the lifestyle, food habits and dressing sense of people. And uh, in the people's crowd, we can see many people colorfully dressed and they are wealthy. But some people are sparsely dressed and they are in social in a lower social status. And the social status was disturbed. These people's social status was determined in their basis of caste, occupation, and wealth. The people who were like Mughal, the kings, nobles, priests, officers, etc., were in a higher social status. But the people who was in agriculture field and the uh, handicrafts were in a lower social status. And each and every caste has its own rituals and customs. And in that time, evil customs like study and child marriage were encouraged and prevailed. That is all about the social life of people. Now, let's look at the India, the abode of knowledge, the knowledge of the Indians. So, here is Amar Kusru, a person who lived in India and the Sultanate period. Let's read his description. We, the Indians, can speak any language, but it is difficult for the others to master our language. Indians do not go abroad in search of knowledge. It is the people from the other countries who come to India, says the Panchatandra stories and mathematics are contributions of India to the world. Here it is talking about the people and knowledge of India. As the Indians was able to master the languages and they could speak any language, but it was a little bit difficult for the other people from other countries to master the Indians' languages. There were many languages like Sanskrit, Hindi, Urdu, Malayalam, Kannada, etc. So that was a little bit difficult for the others to master. And these Indians didn't went abroad to in search of uh, knowledge. But it was the other people from the other countries who reached India in search of knowledge. And there are some of the contributions by Indians to the world. And they were chess, Panjalandara story and mathematics. These are all the words of Amir Kusru, the poet who lived in Sultanate period. In that time, there was a lot of educational centers like Nalanda University, etc. In Nalanda University, it had a huge collection of books and it was destroyed in a war. Uh, the main centers of education was Banaras, Agra, Lahore, Kanchi, Madura and Delhi. 
In this time, astronomy and mathematics was advanced. The Leelavadi is a work on mathematics by Bhaskaracharya, the famous mathematician. And some of the observatories in India were Jaipur, Ujjain, Delhi and Banaras. And several types of text was uh, translated into Persian language. Friends, by these we are ending this second chapter, Medieval India Society Resource and Trade. What all did we study in this chapter? We studied about the travelogues of travelers and the agriculture and textile industry, the uh, social life and the trade and commerce etc. I hope you understood and enjoyed this video. If so, please like, share and subscribe to my channel and also press the bell icon near to the subscribe button to get notified when I post new videos. It's me Adi, your body for them. Bye-bye.